So what we're going to do very, very quickly this morning is to preview the future of human consciousness. And um, we're also going to look at how psychedelics can help facilitate the personal development process and, and uh, therefore the evolution of our species. And specifically through the emergence of more complex sensory perception, in other words, expanding our sense of or awareness of reality, and through increasingly complex frameworks for making sense of that reality, and also uh, taking us to a more comprehensive sense of self, ultimately. So what I'm going to talk about is based on a foundation of developmental psychology research. It's research of waking consciousness. And um, developmental psychology is kind of in the same basket as quantum mechanics. And in fact, in history, it emerged around the same time as quantum mechanics. In the scientific realm, most scientists don't understand or apply uh, or even think about quantum mechanics when they're doing their science. And it's the same thing applies in, in psychology at the moment. Most psychologists don't really understand developmental psychology and they don't apply it. So it's, it's one of these kind of leading edge uh, niches. So we're going to look at personal development. In other words, what happens to our consciousness as we grow from a, an infant through to an adult. We're also at the same time going to look at who we are becoming as a species. And in fact, the patterns in, the, in personal development and the evolution of our species are quite similar, almost fractal in, in parts. So this is one of the most simple maps of human development that, that's out there, okay? Just three waves or stages, pre-rational, and then rational, and then trans-rational. And if you want to use a computer analogy, you could think of these as kind of like operating systems, the things that drive our, our values, what we put value on, what we're motivated to do, and in fact, our frameworks for understanding reality. And you'll notice that they're nested inside each other. So they're not separate things. One emerges out of the other. And then you've got a nest of two or three, depending on where your development is at. So pre-rational down the bottom re refers to a time when we are driven primarily by instincts and urges and emotions. And in a personal development sense, that relates to our early life where, and you've all seen this, I'm sure, either in yourself or, or in children, where you just want what you need right now. I feel hungry, therefore I need food now. Or I feel like I want to do this, so I want to do it right now. And there's no uh, cause and effect kind of thinking. It's all about really just satisfying those urges and instincts and, and whatever emotions we're feeling in the moment. Now, I guess we probably see that most markedly in teenagers where they're just impulsive and you try and tell them, that, no, wait, stop and think about what you're about to do. And no, 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 they've just got to do it. And the same thing applies at a species level. So if we look at the evolution of the human species through traditional tribalism, so original hunter-gatherer type existence, traditional tribalism and up to warlord type behaviour that we still see in countries like Somalia and Afghanistan, they're operating primarily on this pre-rational system where it's really about, you know, fixing the problems that they perceive right now and, and satisfying those urges and instincts and, and uh, can often involve violence uh, in extreme cases. So the second level which emerges out of that is the rational. And in a historic sense, we're talking here about around the time of the agricultural revolution where we developed the capacity to grow crops large scale, which allowed us to come together in large groups and live in towns and cities. And it was pretty fine just operating out of that pre-rational place when we were dispersed and in operating in smaller groups. But once we started to live in larger groups, then we needed rules to follow and people had to think about the implications of their actions. And so uh, what we saw was actually literally the development of the uh, prefrontal cortex, the frontal lobes, which brought that rationalising capacity and allowed us to start to think about cause and effect. If I do this now, then these are going to be the, the impacts later on. And it also changed our uh, relationship with time. So whereas we were very much in the moment, down here in the pre-rational place, when we move into the rational place, we can all, all of a sudden start thinking about the past and the future and the relationship between what we did in the past and what's happening right now and what might happen in the future. At a personal sense, that development of the prefrontal cortex really um, comes to, to completion around about the age of 25, okay? So anybody who's... who's uh, younger than 25, 
is probably still operating in a reasonably seeming way out of that pre-rational space and slowly developing this rational capacity to think about cause and effect. And we see that playing out in everyday life where you know people live in a, in a relatively wild way in earlier in their life and then they come to a point where they have this realisation that there's a cause and effect and they've got to settle down, get a regular job, earn money, you know, plan for the future and those sorts of things. So mainstream society at the moment is still firmly entrenched in this rational phase of development. If we sort of take an average of uh, where society is around the world, we've still got elements of humanity that are fully operating in the pre-rational place and those societies tend to be wilder and arguably more, uh, more violent and less stable. Uh, and then we've got a, a big chunk of humanity that's operating out of the rational space where things are more organised, there are rules that are followed, you know, people drive on one side of the road, not both sides of the road, that kind of stuff. Now, when they did this research, and most of what I've studied is, uh, is work of a guy called Claire W. Graves, who never published his research. He did an extensive amount of research but died before he published it, so it's not very well known. If his sample set covered quite a spectrum. So he, he actually found people who are in this trans-rational space, which I'll talk about in a second, and spread right across the, the board here. It's kind of like humanity is a conga line of people bopping along through the development and evolutionary process at a species level. And it's driven by the complexity of their life conditions. Some people are kind of down the back of the line. There's a whole bunch of people in the middle of the line and a few people who are poking, you know, who are, who are sort of leading the conga line and poking into these high levels of, uh, of operation. And trans-rational is uh, the next phase beyond the rational. So transrational is probably best described as operating from a place of direct knowing. I imagine that most of you have probably had a peak experience of that at some point during a psychedelic experience where you pop into a space of just knowing. You just get knowledge, it just comes. So there's no rational process associated with that. And this is one of the values of, that uh, psychedelic uh, practice brings is this capacity to literally pop into the future of human consciousness through peak experiences, okay? Move beyond the rational mind and to, to grow into that space as an individual, it requires a quietening of the rational mind and this is why many of the great traditions teach the importance of the meditative mindset and quietening the rational mind to allow something else to emerge and this is what they're talking about, the emergence of this trans-rational way of knowing. And it also brings a multi-dimensional awareness that doesn't exist in the pre-rational and rational spaces. So to use the analogy of like a, a fish in a fishbowl, when you're living life from pre-rational or rational frequencies, you're like a fish in a fishbowl, okay? You, you're just not aware of the water, but you're swimming in it. And when we move to this trans-rational space, it's like the fish jumping out of the fishbowl and looking back and seeing the water and it's like oh my god I've been immersed in that and there it is and I can see it now so you get this subject object uh, effect happening. There's a, a relationship between these levels of development or waves of development and the complexity of life conditions so when life is simple we don't need to operate in complex ways to cope okay and that's why when we lived in smaller dispersed groups we could get away with operating in this pre-rational way and as society became more complex and the size of our, uh, our gatherings grew and the connections grew, then our mind had to adapt to operate in more complex ways. And this is the result, this emergent, nested nature of human consciousness. So we grow up in an individual sense, we grow up from pre-rational up through these stages and in an evolutionary sense, our species is evolving up through these stages. So another thing psychedelics can help us to do is to cope with change. This is a very, very simple map of the change process. It's, it's like a very simplified version of Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. The green line represents the complexity of our life conditions. And it's, it's a wavy line because there's always that natural variation like a sine wave happening where things wax and wane in nature. And gradually our universe is becoming more complex. So the green line is lower on the left-hand side of the slide than it is on the right-hand side of the slide to reflect that increasing complexity. So when we are evolved or developed to the point where we can solve our problems okay, we're, we're basically sitting on the line. Our problem-solving capacity matches the complexity of our life conditions. And simply by saying, staying there, staying stable, the world is always becoming a more complex place, so we get out of step with it. 
and we get into this stress space. We wake up one morning and we say, you know, things don't feel quite right today. Life just isn't working the way it used to, but I'm not quite sure what the problem is. And that's, that's really the de definitive nature of that stress state. So the first human response there is usually to think back to a time where things were okay. We think, okay, maybe if we go back to living that way, then, you know, it'll fix our problems again. And we see this in society with politicians staying, saying things like, you know, we just need to get back to family values. We need to make America great again, that kind of stuff. Where we're stressed, we don't have the answers, but we think if we go backwards in a kind of regressive search, we'll find those answers uh, back in our personal history. So what that does is, if you think of um, going back to that nested slide, if you think of the, uh, this nested nature as moving up on the page here, you'll notice the, the first stability and the stability up here, one's higher than the other, representing that higher level of complexity of operation. But what happens, this natural stress response is to go backwards. So we're actually going away from where we need to be, which is really weird. It took me years of thinking about why that happens to, to really understand it. But the reason for doing that is um, firstly that, any system, any complex system, to, for it to go through transformational change, it has to dismantle its structure some, to some extent, right? It has to fall apart. You think of like making a, a model out of Lego blocks, you can't just instantly transform a ship into an airplane. You've got to pull the ship apart and then reassemble it. The same thing happens in our own operating systems in terms of our neural networks, our body chemistry and those sorts of things. So we have to fall apart to some extent. And this chaos phase is where that happens. So it's like the alchemist's furnace. And we fall apart because we've actually gone back to simpler values to try and solve our problems. And those simpler values take us even further away from that green line where we need to be to be able to cope. But this is the way evolution happens, and it happens that way because it actually speeds up the change process. It's like a, what I call a slingshot effect. If you can imagine an elastic band, you want the projectile to go that way, but you've got to pull the elastic band back this way to create the tension to then propel the whatever it is that way, right? And this is exactly what's happening here. So consciousness simplifies, and by simplifying, it increases the evolutionary tension, which is that gap between where we are and where we need to be, and that creates an emergent breakthrough effect. And you can see that the red line there is like a, a symbol of being trapped in that space for a while, and I'm sure you've all been there where you've been through major, major change and you've felt trapped, like you can't see the future, you don't know where you need to be, you don't know what you need to do, and everything's falling apart. And then all of a sudden, you'll get some catalyst which will give you an insight into where you need to go next. And that's where psychedelics come in, in terms of greasing the rails for this change process. They allow us to take different perspectives, radically different perspectives on life, and consequently are really, really useful for accelerating that change process at a personal level and also at a, at a social level as well. So what happens in, the, in this uh, chaos space is we get that insight, we suddenly you know, see that there's a different way to live life. And that is literally a result of transformation of neural networks and changes in body chemistry. And then we go to this highly energized renewal state where we can kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel. We know where we're going, we're really energized and, we're, and all of a sudden, you know, we've got the momentum that we need and with proper integration to get back up to a place of stability again, where we're on top of the line in terms of our capacity to cope. So this is a pattern that applies at a personal level when we go through transformational change and it also applies at a species level. So we're seeing in global society right now this descendants into the chaos, you know, with our economic systems, our political systems failing because they've been designed from a mindset that was much more simple than where the world is at right now, a pre-internet age where we weren't connected, right? And they work fine back then, but they don't work well anymore. So what needs to happen right now is society needs to break down to a certain extent and go through this process. And it's only by the old systems breaking down that we create the space for the new systems to emerge. And that, that explains Donald Trump, basically. So back to this nested slide now, showing the waves or stages of emergence. What I've done there is I've just thrown some more detail over the top of that three-stage model to make it an eight-stage model. And very, very quickly down the bottom, we've got hunter-gatherer societies, tribal societies, and then warlike societies in that pre-rational space. This radical transformation that comes with the full development of the prefrontal cortex that takes us into the agricultural era, where all of a sudden we have the capacity to live together in much larger groups and to cope with the complexity that that brings. And all the great societies of history, like the ancient Egyptians and the, and the Greeks and 
uh, uh, Romans and all, all of those sorts of big societies were a result of this you know, agricultural revolution where the capacity to grow crops on a large scale allowed us to, to do more complex things. Then we have the fifth stage here, which represents modern society. So that came as a result of the scientific and industrial revolutions, the European Renaissance, those sorts of things. And it was a, a sort of a, a maturation of this rational capacity. But we're seeing that breaking down now, and we're actually at a global scale, we're in transition now between five and six here, where we're seeing the emergence of this relativistic, pluralistic way of, of being human, which is quite different to the scientific industrial way. It's sometimes been called postmodern. So these things, these higher stages emerge in waves, and it's a bit like the tide coming up the beach. You know, you'll get a wave which will wash up, but then it recedes again, and then another wave will go a bit further up the beach. And we saw the 1960s with the original psychedelic revolution was an example of this sixth stage here emerging, but it didn't have the scaffolding that it needed to hang on to to maintain itself, so it got squashed back down by the scientific industrial modern mindset. But now, with this second psychedelic revolution, we've got the internet as a scaffolding, okay? So we've got what we need to maintain that complexity of operation and to support the emergence of a higher version of being human, a higher frequency of operation. You'll notice up the top here, there's a left brain, right brain label. So these stages, they alternate between a focus on left brain, left brain and right brain operation, which brings either an express self dynamic where we want to change the world to fit the way that we want it to be. And that was very, very strong in stage five, the modern era, which we're just coming to the end of. And then on the other side, you've got a sacrifice self dynamic where we go, well, how should I change myself to fit with what the world needs. That's just like a pendulum that swings backwards and forwards. So right now we're swinging from this highly individualistic modern mindset uh, back towards a communal community mindset. And I'm sure you're all feeling that very strongly. You could also, in a very, very general sense, say masculine for the right-hand side and feminine for the left-hand side. Those themes apply. So we're swinging back to a more feminine version of being human. Now this can run backwards as well. All right, it's not always forwards. And I've been to countries that have uh, evidence of like stage four, stage five civilization sitting in ruins and they're actually operating back down here in, in stage three. So it's not always forwards and that can apply at a personal level as well. If your life conditions deteriorate, then you can uh, slide back down the, the spiral here also. The moral of the story here is that, and it's, this has been proven through studies of meditators, Repeated peak experiences over time, which push your consciousness into these higher waves or stages, repeated over time will accelerate your personal development. Okay, there's good evidence for that. And integration of those experiences is a very, is a very important part of that process. So if you are going to take what is a, a peak state of consciousness and then transform it into a, a stable stage of consciousness, you have to integrate those peak experiences over time. So there's got to be an integration process. The second takeaway is that this whole thing is driven by the complexity of life conditions, okay? Human consciousness is ultimately highly adaptive. And when we're faced with problems that are more complex than we're used to, then our consciousness will adapt according to this pattern to higher and more complex ways of operation. And in that ad adaptation process, it involves physical and chemical changes. It also involves an expansion of our, our sensory perception as well. And I'll just I'll finish uh, very quickly with a, a short piece about some um, research that hasn't been published yet, but it's been done by the Heart Math Institute as part of their global coherence study where they've been mapping heart rate variability in individuals who are remotely located all around the world. And they found a group within their study set whose heart rate variability is fully in sync, even though they're not co-located. And I expect that this is a physical or experiential manifestation of the emergence of this sixth stage of human consciousness and how it's gonna play out. We have a heart connection, even though we're not co-located. Uh, and a lot of people report this in their developmental process that they can feel the emotions of the world or you know they feel that what everyone's feeling around the world beyond their personal uh, experience. So what happens when we go from this uh, rational to to the transrational? It's like the 
It's like the goldfish jumping out of the water, okay, and looking back. So integrative brings a multi-dimensional awareness. And when we're operating from one of these previous six stages, we're in it and we're consumed by it and we're not aware of the existence of other stages. What we see is other humans who have different values and that we don't like or we don't agree with, but we're not actually aware of this vertical structure of stages of consciousness that are emerging uh, nested within each other. And so integrative uh, brings that multidimensional capacity and it also brings a, a capacity to understand and work with paradox. So in other words, do things that aren't rational to get outcomes. It also is the, really the first time when the left and right brain start to operate in an integrative way. So that's where the, the name integrative comes from. We're no longer so skewed one side or the other side like we are in the previous stages. We're actually st starting to operate in a holistic way. Yes, I, I think so. I mean, if you look at the time in history that each of these stages emerged, what we find is it's like a J-curve. So the early stages lasted a long time and, it, you know, be, between one and the emergence of the next. And those time frames have slowly got shorter and shorter. And one thing we can say for sure is that our impact on our own life conditions is speeding up that process because change is a function of the speed of communication. Okay, once someone gets a new idea, the faster that new idea can spread, the faster we can increase the, you know, the, our, our consciousness, basically. Uh, and as we invent faster communication technology, that line is just going vertical. And that's one of the driving um, devices that's bringing us to this big shift in consciousness between rational and transrational, because we're getting to the point where we can't compute it all anymore, right? We can't compute it like a, a calculator. We've actually got to go to direct knowing. No one knows, really. Um, we can only speculate. The, the research covered 1,065 people and six of them showed up at the eighth stage, which really wasn't enough to get any complete data on. But what we can look at is that there are some recurring patterns in here. So stage one was all about survival at a local level. Stage seven, a strong theme there is survival of the species at a planetary level. And you can all see that coming in society right now, okay, with all the pressures we're facing, is people are getting more and more concerned about the survival of, of uh, our species. Stage two was tribal at a local level. Stage eight, there's a strong theme of global tribalism, neo-tribalism, okay, where humanity is the tribe and the earth is our sacred land. And again, I'm sure you're all seeing that emerging. So what we can do is we can, taking that recurrence, we can look at, okay, well, stage three was about busting out of those tribal boundaries and, and kind of exploring our power. And so maybe stage nine will be about busting out of our, our limitation here on earth and exploring beyond that, whether it be physically, you know, going to other worlds or interdimensionally doing that same thing as well. Um, and so, so the best we can do is like take these themes and imagine what they, they look like on a larger scale and a more complex scale. Yeah, but someone needs to do the research. It really depends on set and setting, okay, and the, and the individual's capacity to integrate what they experienced. But in, in my experience, most people who seek out psychedelics for this reason, what happens is it's kind of like a balloon expanding and then it never quite goes back to where it was. It always has this residual level of expansion. And that's why over time, repeated experiences with proper integration, will you'll, you'll end up at a higher stage. Unfortunately, because this research has never been published, there's not much out there. Um, that's my blog address down the bottom there, emanate.net, uh, so E-M-A-N and the number 8.net. You'll find some stuff on there, including a, an article I wrote for the EGO Journal back in 2011 about the transformation that's happening in society right now. And I'm working on an audio book, which will maybe out next year. All right, looks like we're done. Thank you very much.